Welcome to the Joanne Michaels Show. I'd like to introduce my first guest, Peter Finn, the CEO of Reuter Finn Public Relations in Manhattan, and also the chairman of the Catskill Mountain Foundation in Hunter, New York. Thank you for coming and joining me. My pleasure. Uh, I guess I'm absolutely astonished at the transformation in the town of Hunter since you've arrived. <laughs> when did you arrive? Well, uh, I've actually, I didn't quite arrive. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, bought property in the village of Hunter about 100 years ago. Really? So um, I've been coming to Hunter all my life. Uh, my wife and I uh, got seriously involved in Hunter, though, about 10 years ago. And it's really in the past three years that uh, we've been, we started an organization called the Catskill Mountain Foundation, which I think is what you're referring to. Right, the foundation, but also if you're just driving through Main Street, you notice the bookstore and art gallery. Right. There's a organic farm market correct. on the weekends, yes. correct? Actually, it's now open uh, six days a week. Really? Yeah. And the movie theater is all spiffed up and looks terrific. Yeah. And you have yeah. a lot of different entertainment going on, uh, dance, well, yes. performances in a theater. Right. We have uh, a ballet and other types of dance in the spring. Um, we have free concerts Saturday afternoons in the summer. We have a classical music series in the fall and, mm -hmm. and during the winter. Uh, so we, we are doing lots of different things. It's what I noticed uh, when I came up is that it's the town which I when I moved to uh, Ulster County 20 years ago, I skied at Hunter, and it always was surprising to me why the town of Hunter, unlike Wyndham and many of the other towns, wasn't more inviting to tourists. It was, it, they did nothing, really. Nothing was done in that town to make it look enchanting. You know, it was the opposite of a New England village. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, what made you all of a sudden invest there? I suppose you've really, I mean, you've, it's been, uh, look, Hunter's been there a long time. Right. <laughs> it's an old ski area. Yeah. So what was it that propelled you to do this? Well, I've, I've always loved the area. Uh, as I mentioned, I would, go there um, from time to time every year since I was a kid. Um, when I met my wife in college, um, one of the first things I did is to take her to my place in Hunter, to mm -hmm. show her my place in the mountains. And um, then when my kids were little, we would take them up there for weekends and we would take them on hikes. And, mm -hmm. and actually there was a point when we were carrying both kids in sort of uh, homemade backpacks that we mm -hmm. for, for carrying them and we went on long hikes. I, I, I mean, I've loved the mountains my whole life. Um, so we took over the family property about 10 years ago. I see. Um, and the house, the family house had been in serious disrepair. So we spent the first four or five years uh, renovating the house. And we looked around and we noticed that um, the movie theater had been for sale for years. Right. And um, there was a grocery store next to the movie theater that actually shut down and then it was empty and had a for rent sign or for sale sign. Um, and this was all in the village. My house was uh, a three minute walk from the village. It's actually in the village, but not right on Main Street. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of upset about it. Oh, there was also a barn uh, on Main Street that- um, That's across the street from that theater, from the movie right? Theater, right. That, um, was in serious disrepair. It looked terrible. And um, it was for sale. And um, so that's actually the first thing we did is we, we bought, my wife and I bought that barn. Mm -hmm. there had, it had been abandoned for close to 10 years. It had been a dairy barn and then it was a series of nightclubs and then it was abandoned. And there were birds living in it, there were raccoons living in it, the kids had vandalized the inside. So. The, b the bars had put mirrors up everywhere, and the mirrors were all in pieces on the floor. So we bought the building, and my wife and my son and I spent a week, a week's vacation with shovels and <laughs> dumpsters shoveling out broken glass. Really? And I actually almost fell through the floor in the back because it had rotted out. Um, but 
Today, it is a spectacularly renovated building. Now, right? is that your offices? The offices uh, our offices are, are now there. Right, uh, the that, foundation that's, offices. it is a spectacular building. And then upstairs is a uh, performing arts center for the Catskill Mountain Foundation. That's where we do some of our dance performances, all of our classical music performances. Uh, originally, I actually renovated it as a retreat for my staff in New York City. It's a I place see. to go for two-day retreats. And we still do those. But I realized the building was sitting empty except for those mm -hmm. two days a month. So we've now, we're now using it for the Capsicum Mountain Foundation for, the, for offices and performances and so on. So um, the, the renovating that barn was the first thing we did. And then um, when we finished that, I looked around and said, well, let's see if I can do something with the movie theater. And the movie theater was dingy and horrible inside. And now it's got to it's totally renovated in, inside the, the theater. Um, we have beautiful new murals, historic murals that we put in, and um, classic style columns. We have not renovated the lobby yet, but we have state funding for a new lobby, a second screen, which will, the second screen will be devoted to foreign and independent films. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And then a new facade. And all of that is happening in the next six months or so. Now, what kind, tell me some of the dance groups that you've had. I know I was up there and I, there was an incredible array of classical music, dance, theater, uh, even poetry, uh, and different festivals that right. you have. And this um, schedule of events that I picked up was, was quite or complete. And, and uh, you know, it, it looks like you've been in business for many years. Right. So what are some of the uh, highlights of your season? Well, let's see, this, uh, this, this year we had uh, the American Ballet Theater uh, Studio Company. It's the development company for New York City's American Ballet uh, mm -hmm. uh, Theater. And um, we actually, c they could not perform at our facilities because our facilities weren't big enough. So we used the local high school and they were stunning. They were really great. Um, we also had a uh, Spanish dance company and they did perform, um, i trying to remember if they performed at our Red Barn Performing Arts Center, but they were also great. The audience loved them. And then we had a, um, another dance group called Secondhand Dance and they were very funny. And they, I didn't know what to expect. I'd never seen anything like it, but they were also great. Um, in terms of uh, classical music, we've, uh, we have the Manhattan String Quartet uh, this spring. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see, we've had, we've had uh, some terrific groups. Now, you're having a big festival in mid-July, on the 14th of July this yes. year, but I think, what is that? Okay, um, that is our Mountain Culture Festival, and uh, this is our second uh, annual uh, Festival, Mountain Culture Festival. We plan to do that every July. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, we have a lot of different things going on there. We have um, the best of the Mountain Film Festival from Telluride, uh, uh, Telluride oh, really? Colorado. Mm -hmm. They have an annual film festival. All the films are made in mountain regions around the world and about mountain regions, adventure in mountain regions, and et cetera. And um, so we, uh, Friday night, I believe it starts uh, July 13th. Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday, we'll be having uh, ongoing films from the uh, film in the film festival. We also and that will be in the theater. That's in the okay. movie theater. Uh, we also have um, uh, music performances uh, all day Saturday and Sunday. Um, we have great performers. Uh, part of the uh, festival this year actually is a tribute to Bob Dylan. Oh, really? And mm -hmm. his influence on music in the Catskill region. Um, and uh, then we have... Uh, so are you going to have like rock music as well or is this It's really more folk. Folk music. Folk music, mm -hmm. yeah. We, and we have uh, musicians coming from mountain regions around the country. There's one actually who's influenced, and I think his heritage is from uh, mountains of the U Ukraine. So we'll oh, have a very interesting uh, music program. We have um, 60 to 70 craft vendors from the region. Uh, we've you know, talked to many, many crafts, uh, craftspeople and selected those that we feel really represent the mm -hmm. region the best. And they'll be there showing their work and selling their work. Uh, we'll have farms. Uh, Are you going to have the farm market? Uh, the farm market, well, the, the, the uh, festival is right in the village of Hunter on the grounds of the uh, Foundation's Performing Arts Center. So in the Red Barn, now we have the Great Catskill Mountain Quilt Show. It's going to be the largest quilt show, my understanding, or one of the largest quilt shows of quilts made in the Catskill, re Catskill region ever shown. And um, that's going to be in our Red Barn Performing Arts Center. The craft vendors will be in tents surrounding the Red Barn. 
We also have animal vendors, alpacas, llamas, goats, sheep, uh, other types of animals, fr all from farms in the region. Uh, our own farm market uh, will be um, open. We have our own community organic farm. We will be giving farm tours constantly during the weekend, uh, explaining to visitors who are interested exactly how we're running our farm and why we're doing things the way we do it. So you have a farm there as we well? We have our own farm. Yeah. Okay. And so we, we supply our own farm market to some extent now. We're, we're, this is our second year of our farm, and our goal is to expand that farm. We, we will be growing in the winter also in greenhouses. So our goal is to supply our community with organic produce That's on a year-round year basis. That's great. And it, we yeah. also, it's an educational facility. We do uh, tie-ins with the schools mm -hmm. and during the winter as well as the summer, the spring, the fall, and the kids come. They have their own plot where they plant some things and they watch every week things grow and we explain to them what we're doing. And co we work with Cornell Cooperative Extension on this program. So what are some of the, I know Kingston has a farmer's market on Saturdays from 9 to 2. Right. And they have, I, I was really impressed that all the people who come from the region. Right. I mean, they, it's more of a regional thrust here. Right. Um, do you have, is yours just from your, the products from your farm, or do you get people coming from the area well, we, who do we, the bread baking and the cheese we, making and the, you know, all that kind of we thing? Do, we do um, buy from other area farms, and we also buy from some national distributors. We're not growing enough yet ourselves to supply the market mm -hmm. independently. Uh, but we do get bread, for instance, from Bread Alone, which is you know, an important mm -hmm. bakery in the area. Um, the difference between what we do and the farmer's market in Kingston is in a farmer's market, generally, the farmers who grow the produce or uh, produce the They're goods, there. they come and mm -hmm. sell their own goods. Um, our market, we are buying from farms and selling. The farmers don't have to be there. We do plan to add a farmer's market component that would only be uh, Saturday afternoons probably, where farmers would come and we'd have space where farmers could come and sell their own mm -hmm. goods. But we're not up to that yet. Uh, we're, we're moving our farmers market to another building in the hopefully not too distant future that's right on Main Street. It's a substantially larger building and has surrounding grounds where we'll be able to do the farmers market. I see. Well, so you have people then that you've hired locally yes. who are running all these things yes. because you spend, don't you spend your weekdays in Manhattan? I, yes, <laughs> I, I'm so, in the city uh, yeah. Monday through Friday. The foundation, well, we, ha we have quite a few operations at this point, and we have a total staff of close to 30 people. You do. Uh, mm -hmm. Running the bookstore, the art gallery, the movie theater, uh, the farm market, the community farm, um, the performance program. We published the Catskill Mountain Region Guide. We have a number of staff members in that. We run an elder hostel educational program. Um, and then we're, we're constantly renovating our facilities and expanding our facilities. So we have a staff of people who are working on that. So we, we have quite a large group So what do point. you see uh, down the road uh, for this? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, like you say, you, you've been coming up for 10 years, but the last few years really are when this all took yeah, place. Right. So what do you see coming? Well, uh, I, I, my uh, goal and expectation is that everything we're doing will continue to expand. And um, I think once we have the second theater in and the new facade, I think people will talk even more because you, you won't be able to drive by without stopping and talking mm -hmm. about it. Once, um, so I think that will be an important addition. Right now the Red Barn is a significant visual enhancement to the community, I think the movie theater will become the same thing. Then the building that was a gas station that we plan to t turn into mm -hmm. a new farm market um, will, t instead of being sort of an ordinary looking building, that will also be a visual enhancement to the community. And I think you know, each piece adds to the whole. And I think over time, um, you won't be able to drive through the village of Hunter without noticing these things and saying, wow, what's going on here? So um, I think our farm will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And right now we have a s small staff in the farm. We have three people who are working pretty much full time Because that's there. a big business to be, to be running that kind of thing. See, I know it's seasonal, but it's still Right, well, and, and our hope again is to turn it into a year-round operation so we can provide full-time employment for people working on the farm. And we can pr grow produce on a year-round basis for uh, the community. Um, so I think the farm will be bigger, the farm market will be bigger, the movie theater, uh, is only open uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the fall, winter, and the spring. It's open seven days a week during the summer. My hope is that that will be open seven days a week 
Uh, the bookstore is now open. Bookstore and gallery is open five days a week. Mm -hmm. I hope that will be open seven days a week. Um, so um, I think it will become busier and busier. Um, there are some other... What about a restaurant? Um, there, there is a really fine restaurant uh, about a mile away, uh, Mountain Brook Dining, which is right at the entrance to uh, Hunter Mountain. And maybe there'll be some more restaurants that will be attractive. I don't know. We, we don't plan to go into the restaurant business. Gonna, We're not going to go into the restaurant business. This is a not-for-profit organization. And we do need to have some businesses to help support the organization to keep it in business. But um, we're really focusing on the arts and farming. Farming has always been an important mm -hmm. part of our mission and part of it because I've always believed that interacting with farms and, and just seeing farms mm -hmm. is part of the cultural experience of coming to the country. So I wanted to bring the culture that you would find in the city or you also find in Tanglewood, you find in, in many places right. in the country. I wanted to bring that to Hunter, Hunter I but I also wanted to bring back part of the cultural experience that people have always looked for in the country but find it harder to find because so many farm, farms have disappeared. Right. So we definitely want to bring farming back as part of the cultural experience people have there. Yeah, no, it's, that's, it's interesting. How about, I mean, everybody who has been in the area for, you know, I, I've only been there 20 years, but everyone who's been there they has always said, well, the Slutsky's own hunter. Have you worked with them? Absolutely. They own Hunter Mountain, and they, they were yeah. there. These guys are, I used to see them on the mountain skiing well into yes. their 80s. I, I yeah. mean, one of them must be at least 90. Well, I think, so. I think that uh, Orville and Izzy Slavsky are both in their 80s. Yeah, um, they're, they're, but they're, they're still working they every are, day. They're they, incredible they, men. Yeah, they, and they are really terrific supporters of what we're doing. They are. Uh, they okay. have been significant financial supporters, and we are collaborating on a World Culture Festival um, in August. Uh, mm -hmm. Beginning of the first weekend in August, we are doing a World Culture Festival at Hunter Mountain. Hunter Mountain approached us and asked if we would help put this together, and uh, it's going to be extraordinary. We have performers coming from all over the world uh, to come perform really? for these two days. It's going to be great. Because they had a series of festivals which have had gone up and down, and right. depending on who was running it. Yeah. But that's interesting that they maybe yeah. those festivals can be get more of what you're doing. Yeah. Involved. They, so, some of their long term. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Some because of, some of them, they've just been tired. They, some of their long term festivals are successful and are continuing, but I think they were interested in, in what we've done. We, we actually had a performance last Labor Day, uh, last summer, mm -hmm. uh, La Labor Day weekend, of a group of taiko drummers from Japan. Uh, I think there were 17 or 15 taiko drummers. And I'd never seen them before. Um, we were going to do it outdoors. What are taiko drummers? They perform on big drums. It's a, uh, uh, his, um, it's a very traditional uh, performance um, Japanese program, performance program. Actually, it goes back, I believe, to um, uh, they used to do this during uh, battles oh, to really? inspire the fighters. Really? Mm -hmm. And um, they had this one drum that I don't know what it weighed. It was huge. It was probably 10 feet big. It took many men to move it. And we were going to do it outdoors, but it rained that week, and we had arranged with Hunter Mountain that we would do it indoors at their facility in the event of rain. Um, we crammed 750 people into the room to watch this performance, and it was a stunning performance. And there was a long line of people outside uh, who wanted to come see this, at, from the building all the way out to the parking lot, and we, it was just not safe. We couldn't let anybody else mm -hmm. in. Some people listened from the outside. A lot of people were turned away and disappointed. And after that, Hunter Mountain said to us, you know, I think you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, how about yeah. bringing them back and doing a World Cultures Festival? Mm -hmm. Now, that particular group of taiko drummers was not available. They, had, they were in the US from Japan anyway for a performance at the UN. And I had some connections with them. And they found out about what we're doing. And they, they mm -hmm. came and performed. But we do have a group of taiko drummers coming again this year. And we have many other. Uh, so it'll be different um, uh, cultural, like uh, yes. different from European cultures, yes. dance and Asian culture, different Absolutely, dance yeah. groups a and, and African and music. We had, uh, several African. Because you groups. know, Hunter always had you know the German Alps festival. They had the Irish, the Celtic festival. Yeah. And this you will know, be very little, often. This, this will be a little more exotic. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you yeah. get a different crowd. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you also. Um, 
Rudolf Finn has been in the PR business for a long time. Yes. I remember getting out of college and I remember the name. 52 Ruder years. and Finn. Yes, 52 years. Okay, so, yeah. And I'm not 52 years. Uh, I haven't been here for 52 years, let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I, I was curious I've been here for about, 25 years. Oh, you have. Okay, yeah. so you... So you sort of assumed your father's mantle here, my, my right? My father started the company uh, with Bill Reuter, uh who actually happens to be my uncle. Oh. Uh, my father is still here, um, and he and I are partners, and I have uh, several other partners, three, three sisters. Oh, the girls are now in. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've, been, we've been partners together mm -hmm. for a very long time. And uh, uh, Bill Reuter has an office here, but hasn't been active in the business for a very long time. So uh, when, when I got involved in the company, it was, it was a much smaller company than it is today. So you, when you, where did you go to college? I went to Brown uh, for undergraduate and then Columbia for a master's. So when you got out of school, you came right here to work or did yeah, you do anything? Yeah, no, I, I, I did after graduate school. Um, it was not what I planned to do. I actually had planned to teach. But uh, at that particular time, uh, there was a scarcity of teaching jobs and I started working here just, I didn't have anything else to do at the, that particular moment. I did not intend to stay, but I ended up um, building a uh, survey research department here, which after about five years uh, was the biggest single profit center in the company. Uh, we had a staff of about 30 people, and it, it had become known. Qualitative or quantitative research? Uh, both, mostly quantitative. Uh, we were doing national surveys for clients. And when I would meet somebody from Roper or Lou Harris and I said, I ran research and forecast, they said, yeah, how, how are you doing all the things you're doing? And we were doing some very interesting surveys. Uh, they were all client-sponsored surveys on interesting topics. What year was this? Oh, was uh, this the 70s? 77 to 84 is when I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really moved into the management of Ruder Finn from running research and forecasts in 84. So I've been part of the management of the company now for 17 years. I like the mountains, but I like the city too. And I really see myself continuing to sp split my time the way I do now on a long-term basis. So I'm, I'm in the city Monday through Friday, and I'm in the mountains on Saturday and Sunday. Are your children grown? Or? Yes, but both my kids are in college now. And they used to, when they were little, they used to come to, to the Casco region with me and my wife every weekend. And um, then when they were in their mid to late teens, they started to get restless. They really wanted to stay home with their friends. Right. <laughs> and um, we had a decision to make, and we, we kept, my wife and I continued to go up on the weekends, and my kids stayed home, and we worked it out, and things were fine. And uh, now they're in college, and so they're, they're mm -hmm. doing their own thing. Yeah, so you could do whatever you want. You know, my, my son just graduated, so I know that, <laughs> how that is. But um, do you think that this is something that, like, one of the villages that I like very much also is Wyndham. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there will be any connection with Wyndham doing, you know, uh, yes. how do you, do you work Actually, with that community? Because that's an interesting community. There's a, there's a group there, there's a, um, a couple, uh, Bob Mano and uh, Mag his wife Magdalena, uh, they run the Wyndham Chamber Music Festival, and mm -hmm. they, they both uh, have just retired from the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Oh, wow. The one actually mm -hmm. was, with, was with the orchestra, the other um, was with the um, I was saying uh, with the opera and um, they have had a series of concerts and they are incredible concerts they are really uh, fabulous concerts we are doing a collaborative program with them the end of the summer we have a mountaintop string quartet festival mm -hmm. Labor Day weekend we will have five string quartets in five concerts in five different locations on the mountaintop over the three-day weekend uh, so for, it starts Friday night at the Catskill Mountain Foundation's Performing Arts Center in the Village mm -hmm. Hunter. And we will have a concert in Wyndham, a concert in Lexington, a concert in Jewett, and a concert in Prattsville. Oh, so That's we're, great. it's, our, it's mm -hmm. our first mountaintop program. And my guess is that we will do more regional programming. We've, we've had conversations with uh, people in Woodstock about some yeah, collaborative we programs. Have in Woodstock, the Maverick concerts right. which have been an institution right. for years. One of the problems though in uh, Woodstock with the Maverick is that the people who go are all older, older, uh, you know, in their 70s, 80s. You know, I think it, it's a real challenge, and I'm sure you know this, to get the younger community right. and expose young, 
younger kids to classical music because it's hard. Right. You have children. I, yes. you know, my son. I remember with the piano and the, you know, he's for different it's programs. Hard. We get a different mix uh, in the audience. Um, the dance programs we've gotten a very good mix. Uh, some of those are really more youth oriented. Um, classical music. Uh, we did have one classical music program that was specifically for little kids, and that was that was very interesting. The kids actually participated in the performance at various points, and we had oh, sort of planned it that way. Yeah, that would be interesting to do more of that. I I just think I pl played piano for ten years when I was a kid, and I know. I, there were times I didn't want to, but you know, it's really a very, very important thing to know about classical yes. composers and music and that. And I, I just feel badly that you know, in the computer age, it's very hard to get the young kids interested. We're, we're trying to provide arts for our, all the different audiences up there: the full-time residents, the weekenders, younger people, older people, and you know, that's part of what the movie theater is about too. We're showing Hollywood films, mm -hmm. but we're showing foreign and independent films. Um, we show we we have uh, classical music, but we also have some folk rock music during the summer, our Saturday afternoon summer series. We're going to have Gilbert and Sullivan, a New oh, York really? City wow. theater group, is coming up to do a um, Saturday afternoon Gilbert and Sullivan pr uh, program, the best of Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, you really have your work cut out for you. I mean, it's a great challenge to be able to do this. Well, first of all, geographically, but also to do such an eclectic. Mix. It's hard work, I'll tell you, it really is hard <laughs> and work. And you work all week, and you're still doing it. I, I um, am working 12 to 14 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week. And it's, it's... Now, does your wife work also in this thing? She does, yes. I'm chairman of the organization, mm -hmm. she's president. Uh -huh. um, so she's involved in the Hunter... In the Catskill Mountain Foundation. And we call it the Catskill Mountain Foundation because we're trying to do something that's really focused on the whole Catskill Catskills, region. Catskills, not just Hunter. Right. And our magazine, the Catskill Region Guide, is very much focused on the whole region, and not just the Catskill right. region. I but pick it up all the time and I've yeah. read it and it's really excellent. So any of you out there, if you do see it lying around, the Catskill Guide, I have a, a copy of it right here. Make sure that you pick it up because there's a lot to read in it and there's almost no decent regional publications. It's a real yeah. problem, I think, uh, in identifying as, an, as a region for the Hudson Valley. Right. Um, Anyway, Peter, thank you very much for sure. taking time out of your busy day to join me. And I wish you a lot of luck with it, thank and you. I'm definitely going to get up there. Good. To, I look forward to it. You know, I'll show you everything. around. Good. Good. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. I'd like to welcome my next guest, Lois Brenner an attorney with offices in Manhattan and in Red Hook in Dutchess County. She is the author of Getting Your Share, A Woman's Guide to Successful Divorce Strategies, and she's good enough to spend some time with me today. Lois Brenner, I, I really um, look at this book, Getting Your Share, A Woman's Guide to Successful Divorce Strategies, which I looked and you had written this, it was published in 1989, That's which right. I almost feel you were ahead of your time there with this, because Karen Winner's book, Divorce from Justice, How Women and Children Are Abused by Divorce Lawyers and Judges, was published within the last few years. So I think a lot of the issues you know, uh, that you deal with in here, the baby boom generation is now really confronting in their divorces. And, and uh, what motivated you to write it back then? Well, thank you for the compliment. Um, there was nothing out there that told people what they needed to know when they were about to go through this process. And I noticed that people made the most mistakes at the beginning of the case. Uh, people would stop supporting their wives. They wouldn't let their husbands see the children. They would move out of the house. So these were mistakes on both men and women's sides. Yes. They, exactly. Because that was my feeling. I had the uh, president of Father's Rights on a recent show with John Hurd for an hour. Mm -hmm. And they discussed the um, criminalization of the father. You know, the father yes. is the visitor, the mother is the custodial parent. But as you know, two million men have custody. They're the primary custodians now of their children. 
and that all happened in the last 10 years since this book was published. Well, actually, it, it was just reissued. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, people can get it online. Um, and Is that as an e-book, you, you mean? Yes, I think it's on um, uh, Borders and Barnes and & Noble and Amazon.com and iUniverse. Mm -hmm. um, so I was happy to get it out there because like many serious life experiences, people don't know what to expect until they go through it. Right. And by the because time they, you've yeah, gone through it, uh, you are learning by your mistakes. And this right. is That's so what much happened to me. <laughs> and you don't also, it, you have to remember, it's the first time all of, most of us have ever dealt with a lawyer. So even something as routine as dealing with a lawyer how they bill you, what questions to ask, all those kinds of things, what the procedures are. It's very alien to, to all of us. Yes. Unless somebody is an attorney or has had legal dealings in the past, which most people, the first time they deal with a lawyer is in a divorce. Exactly. I mean, if you're not buying a house or writing a will, uh, you generally don't have to deal with a lawyer. And here you are dealing with a lawyer at a time when you're in pain, when you're angry, when you're hurt. And the, the issues involve a whole constellation about your life. I mean, it's, it's your, your children, your marriage, your place in the community, uh, money. And I find that the court system is not a great place to be dealing with these issues. Uh, I think a lot of them are sociological issues, they're psychological issues, mm -hmm. and people really need practical advice because they start acting out and then they get into the legal system expecting justice and fairness, and that often doesn't happen. Exactly. That's and what's been most of the people I've had on my show, whether they're Supreme Court judges, attorneys, or litigants, that has been the, the what we've seen in other words don't go there because you're not gonna you know you go into court expecting justice and fairness and you're not gonna get it most exactly. of the time exactly uh, because so what you do maybe is you try to get your clients to settle before they go to the court is that what you try to do oh definitely I mean mm -hmm. that's always it's always good to try that first if it's at all possible um, and lawyers have a bad reputation of fueling the flames of the divorce animosity, you know, that's what seems to happen. Unfortunately, there is a lot of that. Um, I mean, I love to do mediation, and you can do in 12 hours with the right people and the right situation what it might take people two, three, four years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. The, um, the trick to it is to get people to be reasonable. For example, uh, if a woman is about to get divorced and her husband has left her for another woman, she might say to me, you know, I don't want to let him see the baby this weekend and he wants to come on Sunday. So I might explain to her that I understand that. However, if she doesn't, he can go to court and he can ask for custody of the child. And a judge might very well give it to him because they don't like it when one parent interferes with the time of the other parent. So, you know, she is risking spending a lot of money on a custody battle that she might lose. And she might want to rethink that, let him see the child, because after all, children can use two parents. He's more likely to pay child support if he has a relationship with the child. And if she's angry at him, maybe she should find another way to take it out on him. Right. But why isn't, Lois, one of the things that I uh, ask the father's rights people, and I'll ask you, why isn't joint custody the norm? Why in New York State, 13 states out of 50 have joint custody as a given, but New York State is not one of them. It is very, very behind the times, it seems to me, in the divorce arena. Helene Weinstein and the Assembly in New York, in Albany, has done nothing in 10 years to change these laws that are antiquated. And I, a bunch of us are going to go up there and knock on her door one of these days. Maybe she'll be there. Oh, I've been up there when you. she's not there. Mm -hmm. So we'd all like to know what's going on up there. These people are making a lot of money. And they're not changing the divorce laws. And joint custody is not the norm. The woman, by and large, or there is a custodial parent or one other 
one or the other, most of the time the woman. And I have to say, I don't believe in that. I believe that joint custody should be the norm. It's these not, and, and these are things that, and, and why do you think that is? The lawyers tend to gain in a system where, and New York State has a lot of lawyers, where, where it's not the norm. Do you think it's, it has to do with that? That the lawyers have a vested interest in not having joint custody so that people can go into a trial and hash it out? There are a number of factors. I mean, clearly, there are situations where custody doesn't have to be an issue. I mean, this comes from England, where mm -hmm. um, you had feudal land, and it went to the, um, the son, and custody was important. And it kind of came over to the United States and should have been dismissed. I mean, there shouldn't even be an issue about custody. All that it means is the right to make decisions. But people seize on it and they, they use it to hurt the other party. All of a sudden, one day you have perfectly okay parents, both of them, and the next day they're getting a divorce and they think that one of them has to have custody. So um, unfortunately, you know, the lawyers don't often discourage custody mm -hmm. issues. Um, and for example, I've, I've dealt with people who were living apart for several years and they were working out the visiting arrangements beautifully. And then lawyers came in on the other side and they start writing me letters about, um, you know, your client um, came two minutes early to pick the children up. And I'll write back that, you know, I don't do custody. These people have been dealing with each other for two years. I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. And it kind of astonishes them. And then they write back to me a week or two later, well, something else happened. You know, when, when he came to pick up the children, she didn't turn over their briefcases quickly enough. And I'll write back, I don't want to hear about this. Let them work it out themselves. And then they'll say to me, well, if your client will let him see the children a little more, then he'll give her more money. And I will say, you know what, even if he didn't give her a penny, he's going to see these children because she wants them to have a father. So the system yeah. is set up. It's an adversarial system. Exactly. And it encourages this kind of stuff. Exactly. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that these reforms in the divorce laws have been languishing in Helene Weinstein's family uh, and child committee, or whatever she's the head of up there. Um, but I think that because this is such a uh, widespread issue and it affects people so uh, like you, you may say well custody is, is decisions but what about when a woman has custody and she decides to send the kid away to private school or send the kid away to camp and there's no input from the father then you have trouble or uh, decides not to John Hurt's uh, ex didn't vaccinate his son he doesn't think that's a great idea Mm -hmm. So it, he had no input. There was no discussion of it in the court. These are issues that come up, and it seems that it's, the judges have too much discretion when you go to trial. They, the individual judge makes decisions that they are not qualified really to make. They don't know these children. They don't really care about their welfare. How can they be deciding? issues of, chi of child's welfare like this. This is what is so frightening. That's a I great question. Uh, I, can you answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, in there in the arena. I Where think I that the system doesn't work. I, I don't think it's set up properly. I, I think this is more about people needing therapy and learning how to raise children and you know perhaps it shouldn't be judges and lawyers, but perhaps there should be a therapeutic process that people go through. In fact, some of the courts, you know, in Dutchess County and even in Manhattan now are starting to set up parenting programs um, because, you know, judges are not experts in raising children. Um, in fact, Judith Hillary, the Supreme Court judge in Dutchess, yes. never married or had children. She's come on my show. And I asked her, I said, are you married? She said, no, I never have been. I said, and you never had children? She said, no. Now, she sits on the Supreme Court. I'm right. not saying she's, a, she's uh, I've only heard good things about her. She's probably a good judge. But there you have it. What is her input in there? Or what is somebody else? My Supreme Court judge, Joseph Taraka in Ulster County, 
was going through a contentious divorce in his 70s Ouch. when he was hearing my case. Oh my so, you know, the, he didn't feel he should recuse himself. I asked him afterward. I walked into his office. I said, how could you listen to divorce cases when you were going through a divorce? That's a good question. So these are the things that are going on. He was. He says, well, I could be fair. I said, I don't think you could. It's very subjective. And people are being, judges are being asked to make a choice that probably shouldn't have to be made. I can understand if a parent is abusing substances or has a right. terrible mental illness or you know, has mm -hmm. some other real impediment. But other than that, children need two parents. And this is an artificial construct that somebody has to have custody and that lawyers fight about it. And then when you get into a judge's courtroom, if you don't settle the custody things, this stranger sitting in the bench, which who's just a lawyer in robes, right? He or she is going to decide who gets custody. And often they appoint a so-called expert who is a psychiatrist in the community who is supposed to interview the mother, the father, and the children in various combinations. A forensic psychologist. Yes. I've been there. I had one. And maybe they spend three hours with right. this family, and based upon that, they are supposed to make recommendations. They write a report. Exactly. And then the judge has to look at the report and decide whether to use it or to what extent to use it. Um, I mean, it is a flawed system, um, and your, your results are, are not necessarily fair or reasoned, and I tell people to try very hard to avoid getting into it if mm -hmm. they possibly can. Getting into the courtroom. Into the, exactly, into the legal system and, you know, try to negotiate. Um, but it's hard. Sometimes there are lawyers on the other side who are advising their clients to do things that are just outrageous. Right. But the laws are antiquated and New York, you know, is a little old-fashioned, I think. But don't you think, see, I believe from what I have heard from my guests all ends of it, lawyers, judges, uh, litigants. Uh, what I'm beginning to think is that the reason there are, have been no changes is because these attorneys are making enormous amounts of money. Now, you sound very different, I'm going to be honest with you, than many of the attorneys that I've spoken to Thank and you. even some <laughs> who I've had on my show. So that, it's, it's frightening to think that Many of them, you know, they'll sit here at $250 an hour, many of them, and most and of them at least. that's low for Manhattan. I was just going to say, that's low for Manhattan, but up in upstate, in Ulster and Duchess, where my show is seen, by and large, it's about $200 an hour, $225. So the average income for a family of four in Ulster County is $38,000 a year. Mm -hmm. I don't know how these people, I mean, so what's in effect happening is people are in debt to these lawyers, and then when they get to these judges who make these decisions, I, I don't know how they, you know, with, that are outrageous amounts of child support one way or the other. I mean, you know. So it's, it's, these people can ruin your life. They can take your children away. They can go into your bank account. That's what's going on here. And it's one big billion dollar machine. That's how I'm beginning to see it. And I think that maybe the only way to change it is to have people on this show, and that's what I'm doing, who name the judges like Stephen Kaufman, who was my hearing examiner, who reduced my child support from a multimillionaire to $31.21 a month, or to have on other people to talk about what that judge, and I'm going to do a whole show on this man, by the way. I got four or five people who would like to come on and talk about his work, how they've ruined uh, their lives, how he's ruined their lives financially. Maybe that's the way to do it. I don't know. I mean, that's what I, I feel needs to be done, because maybe humiliation is going to work a little bit quicker, or telling the truth and humiliating these people for their stupidity, is going to work better than trying to lobby in Albany with these legislators who don't really ca care, who like to give lip service to the fact they're changing things. But for 10 years, the bill has been languishing in Helene Weinstein's mm -hmm. office with all these other assembly people not well, doing anything. You know, New York is still a a fault state. The only no-fault right. ground for getting a divorce is if you can come to an agreement. 
and on all the issues and live seven and apart mm-hmm. for a year and then you can get a no-fault divorce. Other than that, you know, it's cruel and inhuman treatment, it's abandonment, it's adultery, and other... Do, what do you do when, when somebody just, when two people are just like, in my case, I told my lawyer, you know, we, we really, I, I was the plaintiff, but the marriage was over. It was 15 years, it was over. I didn't have a boyfriend, he didn't have a girlfriend, nothing dramatic. You know, what would you say to that person? My lawyer took me to the diner and said, okay, I need to make a list of all the things he's done to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because the grounds in New York are just what you said. I looked at him like, what, you want me to make things up? What do you do to your clients when, when that's the case? It's very common. A 15-year marriage is over. People are, it's done. What do you do? Well, the way I approach it initially is that I try to get people to be reasonable, and I try to get the other lawyer to be reasonable, and I come in there with a posture to, let's settle this case, let's talk Mm -hmm. about it, let's try to be fair. And um, there, there are so many pieces to this puzzle that, you know, sometimes you can do that, but sometimes you can't. Right. If you have a lawyer on the other side who is, you know, out to see how much money they can make on this case. And the problem, I think, is that the system is essentially adversarial. Someone is supposed to win, someone is supposed to lose, you're supposed to clobber the other side, you're a hired gun, you're a gladiator, uh, you know, you have to look good, they have to look bad. And so everything gets scripted in a way that is intended to present it to the legal Mm -hmm. system. Um, So there's a lot of provocation that goes on and people's fantasies of revenge get fueled. Mm -hmm. So I come back to people need really good therapy and they need a lawyer who will talk to them about what to do as a practical matter. I mean, a husband will come and say to me, she's been my wife for 30 years, let her go out and earn her own living now, I've supported her, and um, let her go out and make a living, I don't want to give her any support. And I will say, you know, she's 55 years old, she doesn't have a career or profession, she's not prepared for this, if you give her nothing, she will go to court and she will get an order against you. So rather than have a court order against you, why don't you continue paying the bills within reason and let's try to negotiate a settlement. Not in Ulster County. (laughs) You're in Dutchess. In Ulster County, they do what they did to me. $31.21. Hey, no alimony and $31.21 child support. That's from a millionaire. That's what these women judges, I might add, Mary Work and Mr. Kaufman, who was in Ulster at the time, that's what they thought was fair. I have to tell you, it's insanity what these people are doing in that court. It's not just unfair, it's insanity. And these people should not be on the bench. They should be removed. Now, what I would like to ask you is, when you try to reason with these people, okay, uh, you don't want to go in, I agree, you don't want to go before these judges because they have no judgment, (laughs) as as I'm saying. Not just my case, I'm speaking about mine, but I've had people on here talking about their cases. And the same judges keep coming up over and over again. Um, but what, when you can't reason with these people, what do you do? I mean, you know, you try to do that. Um, you try to talk to your client. You try to talk, you know, what happens when you get a terribly unfair decision from a judge? Do you, you know, how do you, what do you do? I mean, is it if worth you, squabbling uh, at $200 an hour, whatever your fee is? Over, uh, that's why I couldn't afford a lawyer because I couldn't afford the $200 an hour to keep my $200 a month. He wanted to pay me less. I went in for an increase, he wanted to pay me less. He was making more millions and he wanted to reduce my child support and I make a middle class living. What do you, I couldn't afford a lawyer. It's a no-win situation. Then I would have had thousands of dollars in legal bills to keep $200 a month. So what do you, when you do have somebody in your, as a client, what do you tell them? Sometimes that happens. I mean, you know, you can't always prevent it. I mean, it's as though you were a doctor and someone comes to you with a fatal illness and, well, you know, you can try to relieve the suffering, but they are going to die. Um, So it really depends on the facts and the situation and the people and the lawyers on the other side Mm -hmm. and who the judge is. And what you're saying and what I'm hearing over and over and what's so frightening is it's all personal. It's all subjective. And that is what is so 
absolutely horrifying because people's lives are destroyed to say nothing of children's lives. Because, you know, when, when, <laughs> when they make these decisions, they don't care about anyone. They give lip service to how they care about children, but they really don't care about anyone's children. I've seen this, I've been there, I've seen how they work. It's all about money. Well, I must say that, you know, there are some judges who are just fine and they try to do their job and they try to, to be fair. But what's presented to them is so off the wall and so egregious. Everybody is lying. Um, you know, people who own their own businesses are sort of expected to hide their cash. Right. And, you know, exactly. They're pretend forced that to. their salary is all they've got when they really have other benefits. And there's, there's kind of a, a process that the legal system takes people through to, um, to manage this. And I think education mm -hmm. is really the answer that people need to learn. They should go for therapy. Sh they should go for counseling. It's better to keep the money in the family instead of, you know, paying it to lawyers. I mean, people can't afford to get a middle class well, divorce anymore. Exactly. Because the poor people, the people with no money in Ulster County get legal aid. That I know. Mm -hmm. And the rich people, like my ex-husband, can afford a lawyer. Mm -hmm. The middle class people, like me, end up going into debt to their attorney or having to represent themselves, which I'm good at because I'm a journalist. But there are people who can't type, can't write, can't do any of that, and are terrified to go up in a court and, and say their piece. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I found is that what do the middle class people do? They end up going into debt to their lawyer. That's Absolutely. basically what happens. They go into debt, they borrow money from friends, they borrow money from their families, they uh, run up a credit card bill. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite horrendous and almost unbelievable. Um, so, I mean, it's, um, it's a huge problem. Um, there isn't one simple solution. I mean, it might be useful to change the, the procedure and to have therapists involved. But see, uh, my experience with most of these therapists, you know, that are appointed by the court, actually, I had one of them on my show, Stephen Silverman. Mm -hmm. he, he got it. He was excellent. And when my ex came up with a phony uh, custody, he filed for sole custody. This guy Got said it. I should get mm -hmm. sole custody based on all the interviews, which, and I was shocked. It was the first psychologist that, you know, forensic psychologist appointed by the court that had any common sense. I mean, actually, I, I did have another one on. I, I see when you're accused of being crazy, you got to go take a sanity test. Cost you a few hundred dollars. It's hard I to prove a negative. I, I, actually, it was easy. I went in, took the test. Oh, we wrote a the point being, it costs lucky. hundreds of dollars. Well, I'm sane. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm certifiably sane because I've had to take that test. Um, and what was interesting was, I, and I met some of the, the psychologists. Uh, Claude Schleuderer was one of them. He gave my, he, I was very impressed with the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. I took the test. And they, he wrote a one-page analysis of my character Good and my personality that was so on target, it was frightening. That's fabulous. Good for them for giving you that I took, because it's yeah. really about character. You will find someone who's a sociopath, someone who's sadistic, someone who is narcissistic. Um, the, the legal system doesn't get that. It so was interesting, but I had to answer 437 questions in 40 minutes because I'm busy. You counted. And I didn't have time. <laughs> well, I saw four. I just, I had 45 minutes to do this, and I just went through and checked off everything and threw it at him and said, and had said, how much do I owe you? I'll write you a check. I got to get on with my day and make money so I could pay my lawyer. I don't have to, and now I got to pay the shrink, some guy to take, give me a test. That's what the court does. It, it, it throws you to experts. Who, and half these people, you know, I don't know how competent they are. They was, a lot of them were nice people. I was honest with them. I said to them, I'm going through a ridiculous custody. Bag. But I'm sure half the people in Ulster and Dutchess County who get uh, charged with absolute lies. Uh, they accused, he accused me of child abuse. I had to go through a whole rigmarole with that. It was nonsense. This costs money. He, so the rich uh, litigant, the wealthier spouse, is the one who has the upper hand because the middle class person is scrambling around trying to make a living. And then on top of everything, he said that I'm not as good a parent because I have to go out work. Yes. So, and and that, that was incredible? The, the ultimate irony was like, how am I going to pay the lawyer, the shrink, all that? I had to pay 50% of all the experts' bills. 
I don't know how John Hurd ends up paying his ex's bills. Nobody ever paid my legal bills, and his ex makes a lot more money than I do. But this is because his judge arbitrarily, there are no standards for this behavior. These judges have the wherewithal and the leeway to make their own decisions about who pays fees and what happens, and that's criminal. Because they are literally putting their hands in your bank account. And you and I are paying their salaries. And that's the crime. And it's about time we looked at what these people are doing. Now, I've had a lot of Supreme Court judges on my show, and the only ones I've had on have been good ones, who have heard good things about. And there are honorable people in this profession. However, there are a lot of people who are creating a lot of misery for a lot of people. And that's the problem. Well, they're asked to make decisions with um, very little information. I mean, you know, how can you interview people for four hours and make a decision about one parent being that much better? Which is why joint custody makes a lot of sense and would eliminate the psychologist's bills. The psychologists get paid by the clients and they get paid by the county. It, they would eliminate a lot of legal bills too, so people in your profession wouldn't make out as well. So that's really but the you problem. Know what? I think if a lawyer is doing a good job, I mean, people will tell their friends. And, Absolutely. You know, they're still going to have legal business. I mean, they might need more clients, but you know, um, I think I agree with you. I think that it's about time that there were lawyers who said just what you're saying, like. This is not, a, like tried to work out compromises and didn't fall into the, the pitfall when they get a letter from the other person's lawyer of writing back another letter at $200 an hour yes. to, to answer nonsense. Right, right. So anyway, I, I, we could go on and on about this. <laughs> you sound like a wonderful uh, you know, person with an attitude that would actually make sense in the courtroom and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and eliminate a lot of well, this. I mean, that's not to say that there aren't occasions when you can't do what I'm talking Absolutely. about and you have to go in there and you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> right. uh, and that's why it's so good that there are people like you who are getting this information out to so society. So we can all have a clearinghouse. And that's what my goal is, to really have a clearinghouse of information about judges, lawyers, and, and the courts in right. our counties. But anyway, I, we don't have much time. But um, Getting Your Share, A Woman's Guide to Successful Divorce Strategies. I would like to read it. I'm sure it could be a men's guide, too, right? Yes, if you're a man, you can you figure can out figure what you out need what to you know need. from there. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for and inviting me on your show. Thanks for joining me tonight for the Joey and Michael Show. And I hope you'll join me again to find out more about the judges, lawyers, and litigants in our county. Good night.